Uh, hello everybody, um, welcome to this Pondicherry Literature Festival where I am privileged to interview Sandeep Punita, the author of this magnificent book called Operation X, which is also a chronicle of something that we all had not known about. You know, all of us have acknowledged the army's role and the Mukti Bahini's role, but none of us, particularly me in the military circles, were not aware about the role that the naval component, particularly the Indian Navy, along with the Mukti Bahini's, uh, the Bangladeshi naval, uh, uh, they played in liberating, creating a historical, you know, uh, event and those things that actually altered the course of the war. So it's a, it's, it is, a, uh, it's a great privilege, and I would like to thank Pondicherry Lit Fest for uh, hosting us. I'm Colonel DPK Pele. Uh, Research Fellow at the Institute of Defense Studies and Sandeep Punitan, the author. So I'm going to ask him what motivated him, what inspired him, and how did he get to this. So I think I'll first begin by asking you, Sandeep, this is a magnificent story. You know, it reads like a, firstly it's a piece of history, and it reads like a, a novel actually, a thriller. And uh, you know, usually military histories or naval histories for that matter are you know, about how X division or Y division and the so-and-so generals move from so-and-so place to so-and-so. But this is a fantastic account of how somebody, you know, an individual has altered the course of history in uh, many ways. Something very phenomenal since the World War ended. I don't think we saw this kind of naval operations. So I want to begin by asking you what inspired you to actually, what actually got, how did you stumble upon the story at all? Uh, thank you, Colonel Pillay, and uh, thank you for those warm words of appreciation about the book. Um, well, this book, uh, believe it or not, is a story that I had been pursuing for almost 25 years. And uh, this is a story that I first read in uh, Vice Admiral M.K. Roy's uh, a book called War in the Indian Ocean, which he brought out on the Silver Jubilee of the 1971 war, where he described in uh, great detail the training of the Mukti Bahaini um, uh, naval commandos, without mentioning, of course, the fact that it was entirely an Indian naval operation which had uh, you know trained armed equipped them and finally launched them into their attacks and it's one of the most fascinating military histories and uh, I'm and for this I'm deeply grateful to my uh, co-author the late captain MNR Samant Mahavir Chakra because he was the uh, man on the ground in 1971 um, he was the G1 uh, of this entire operation he's the staff officer to uh, then Captain M.K. Roy and uh, it, it so happened that a few years ago I was introduced to Captain Samant by uh, uh, Vice Admiral Chavla of the Indian Navy and uh, he said look he has a great story here and I think it needs to be told by a journalist and so that's how this our, our journey began and you know the two years that we spent together we had a number of meetings and uh, that's when the whole scope of this actually hit me. He, uh, you know, Ca Captain Salmon started out by writing his memoirs, wanting to write his memoirs, but I realized that this was far bigger than just his story. It was actually a story of a fascinating operation of the kind that you hadn't seen since the Second World War. Uh, this was, uh, you know, a textbook case of, uh, uh, you know, of, of the Navy improvising, innovating, uh, creating a, a force out of nothing, literally. And uh, let's not forget, this was 1971, where the Navy was far less resourced than it is today. Uh, it had, of course, budgetary issues, manpower issues. It didn't have a special force. But despite all of this, it you know managed to create this. In a matter of months, they fielded this fantastic force of over 400 uh, naval commandos and you know all created out of uh, uh, you know uh, east pakistani college students many of whom had crossed over in, into india uh, you know uh, in the months preceding the 1971 war so it's it's a fascinating story and i'm enormously grateful to uh, captain samant for uh, you know choosing me to tell this story with him and of course the navy and uh, vice admiral chavla so i want to talk about the Pakistani element in this and uh, without which of course this operation wouldn't have been possible in the sense I think the first trigger was the desertion by these uh, people who were in France and yes. that itself reached like a thriller that type of that escape from you know coming in and almost getting caught in uh, Spain and then going back to Geneva can you talk more about I remember recall meeting Chaudhary uh, who had a major complaint that he flew two hours to come in here and he came two minutes to speak <laughs> 
Right. I'd like to hear about that. Yeah, well, well, so the story, uh, uh, you must read the book, of course, but uh, I'll tell you what the uh, story that you're referring to is the desertion of uh, eight uh, Pakistani sailors from the submarine PNS Mangro. Now, this was a submarine that had been uh, commissioned in France and it was on its way back to Pakistan. And uh, that's when the Bengali crew decide to uh, mutiny and escape from the submarine and come back to fight for their uh, beloved Bangladesh. And uh, they were led by this incredible officer called, uh, now, uh, Commodore uh, A.W. Chaudhary. And he motivated these seven uh, colleagues of his to desert the Pakistani uh, submarine and travel to India. Now, this desertion is a court martial offence. I mean, he could be shot for what he'd done, you know, uh, insurrection and uh, encouraging his uh, uh, comrades to mutiny. And these eight submariners from the Mangro, uh, they form the core of what the Navy called Naval Commando Operations X. It's when the eight submariners came to India, they were taken under uh, uh, the RNAW's uh, care and uh, they were then transferred to the Indian Navy and uh, Naval Intelligence. And that's when this idea came in the Navy, in the uh, Directorate of Naval Intelligence headed by Captain M.K. Roy and supervised by Admiral Nanda that we could do something with these uh, eight sailors. We could use them as uh, subortiers, you know, train them as naval subortiers. And that's when the conversation began, like, you know, maybe you could have a larger force. So it began, it had very humble origins, the, the whole operation. You know, it started with eight and it ended up at over 400 because you had Admiral Nanda, the Navy chief, you know, always thought big, thought out of the box. I mean, he, I call him, in a sense, the father of the modern Indian Navy. You know, he was ambitious, aggressive. Uh, he was absolutely certain that the Navy had to play a very prominent role in the 1971 war. And it's because of him and his motivation, and his guidance and uh, his vision that this naval commando operations could be realized. And it all began with that one mutiny uh, by these eight sailors, these very brave sailors uh, in, in France on that Pakistani submarine, as you so rightly brought out. Yeah, that's interesting because uh, it is a rallying call by uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman before he was arrested, when he you know, captured 161 or 163 seats and he was going to be the prime minister of undivided Pakistan. And then when they arrested him and they probably would have tried him had it not been for India. And when he heard it on radio, you know, in a faraway land, and how is, uh, that's very interesting actually. And the role of the Indian embassy there, I really need to acknowledge the fact that, you know, that man was dynamic enough and how Air India collaborated with them, getting them on the flight to Rome. It's very, it, it doesn't treat like, you know, something that would happen to you. It treats like a, a thriller. Yeah, but because, uh, 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 partly because the the whole system, the government, it was uh, the government had followed an all of government approach, uh, and they had set a very clear objective that they were going to go to war by the end of the year, and uh, they had to make it work. So you had for the first time, possibly the only time since independence, that we've had all arms of government working towards a clear objective. Uh, so be it the IFS or Air India or All India Radio or the armed forces, they were all working in perfect sync and. This escape of those um, eight uh, submariners from France, the way the uh, Indian mission in Spain arranged for fake papers for them, got them onto a flight and then, you know, smuggled them into India and, you know, all, all of that points to this uh, united approach that, that all of government approach that I mentioned uh, towards a common objective. And that objective is uh, very clear for you to see by the 16th of December, you had created a new country in South Asia. That's something that is the kind of land that was captured and the number of prisoners that were taken is unprecedented since the World War One. And it's something it also reflects about how India, you know, a country stood up for its uh, humanitarian values. And uh, before the world knew what responsibility to protect was, we did what it was to protect those millions of refugees coming. And to the Western world that turned a blind eye, thanks to Nixon and Kissinger and the lobbying and, you know, I recall uh, reading those blood telegrams that you mentioned in this, Archer Blood, who very vociferously tried to convey to the Nixon administration that there is a genocide taking place and yet they turn a blind. This is the, here is the irony that you have countries of the West which uh, espouse democratic values, just standing by and watching the Pakistani military junta slaughter its own citizens, embark on a genocide of the kind that possibly not been seen since the Second World War, where there was a 
deliberate attempt made to erase the Bengali race and to create a new race of uh, uh, Pakistani collaborators in East Pakistan. And you had the Western world just stand by and watch this. And you had the, on the other hand, you had India waging what I call a dharmic war, a war for righteousness. I mean, wars are never righteous. I mean, there's, there's an element of death and destruction and misery. But here is a case of a war that was fought for a, for a righteous purpose, for a, for a good cause, for a just cause. That is to liberate seven or eight million people from the yoke of uh, uh, the Pakistani military dictation, dictatorship, which the government of India achieved, which is why I call this a righteous war. Yeah, you do invoke that bit about Ashoka Pillar and those four lions in your book. I like that connection because I, and I think this uh, 71 war was, like you said, true epitome of uh, joint manship, which we are trying to achieve today. Of all, the whole of government approach, and that is something very creditable for having achieved it in those days. I think it is much to the credit of the chiefs then. And like, I'd like to talk about Nanda much later, but I'll now, uh, who played a stellar role in this whole thing, you know, from being a spectator in the 65 war to what he did in 71. But I'd like to now go more into the characters of this book whom uh, you have. Could you like, you know, these are all like you've termed them xylophone ribbed, <laughs> you know, youth, uh, famished and hungry and living off just rations of lentils and rice, which is there and how uh, the camp to C2P commander, you know, gets to change the thing and how he gets the naval chief down to his uh, post. You know, Navy assetists look down from the NDA days, we, you know, they call them, uh, we are called Pongos and uh, so Navy is the sister service, it's the smallest, it gets the smallest budget. But how this man actually altered his own standing in the entire Eastern Command and uh, how they actually delivered the first successful strike you know the respect that came up for them after they struck that uh, on the 15th of august that they hit correct, yeah. and so i would like you to tell us more about those characters who made up this commando uh, this and its ncox right so uh, camp uh, c2p uh, uh, was sited on the very battlefield of plassey where that battle was fought in the 18th century and uh, it wasn't by design it was just that it was Plassey was a sugarcane field and the sugarcane had been harvested and the naval divers who saw the spot thought it was a perfect place to train uh, naval supporters. And so they set up this little camp there and uh, the naval training team, a small team of just about a dozen officers and men, uh, very gutsy uh, uh, officers and men from the diving branch. Now the Indian Navy's diving branch is a very unique uh, uh, organization, it's a very small, highly trained, uh, very highly motivated. They're, they could be, they were the forerunners indeed of what you have uh, today as the Marine Commandos. And they trained these uh, young recruits there in Plassey. Uh, uh, they were, of course, carefully screened uh, for their, uh, you know, they, they set up something like an impromptu uh, screening committee that, you know, uh, chose the right recruits. So even though they were xylophone ribbed, as you mentioned, there was something else that they saw in them that, you know, that motivation, that, that fire in their eyes, that that is what kind of um, got them in on board. And also, uh, they looked for recruits who had, uh, you know, some kind of basic education because the kind of uh, skill sets they were, they were looking for, handling explosives and, uh, you know, uh, identifying ships and knowing where to plant those explosives, they were slightly specialized skills um, of the kind, very different from, say, what the, uh, what the Indian Army would expect from the land forces component of the Mukti Bahaini. And um, so they selected these uh, youths and they were highly, uh, you know, trained, very specialized uh, uh, training was given to them. They had different rations as well. So in a matter of weeks, you could see the transformation uh, from uh, of these youth, from those scrawny xylophone ribbed youth to very, uh, you know, lead muscular uh, uh, swimmers. And they were brought there for a purpose to, uh, they were trained as, uh, you know, camouflaged swimmers. They, they, were, they should have had the ability to swim with fins through day and night in all weather conditions and carry that limpet mine on their chest and swim towards the target and plant that explosive on the side of the merchant ship, which is what the whole operation was all about. So this was a perfectly uh, run training camp in the sense that, you know, nothing of this sort had been done before or uh, ever since and that, that's why I call it so remarkable that in a matter of weeks for you to come up with a plan to train 
such a large number of uh, uh, you know youth to train them as naval guerrillas something again that's rarely been done in the sec 20th century in fact I, I think the Viet Cong are the only other uh, guerrilla force that's had a naval component the way the Mukti Bahini had in the 71 war so it's remarkable I mean how all uh, all of this happened uh, 50 years back at, at a time when you thought that you know the Indian armed forces were not capable of uh, doing the kind of things that uh, we we expect them to do today and this is half a century ago. No, I absolutely agree. I, even now I would be amazed if we could get something like this going. Maybe you turn like uh, firstly conceive an operation triggered by the desertion you know, and then get the whole thing running and you have the DNI involved and you know pick up the right people for the right job and I think the story is also about having the right people at the right place at the right time. Absolutely. You know? yeah. And then uh, turning those young, scrawny, little hungry uh, you know, and tired, uh, you know, after all they were going through the ravages of Cyclone Bola, which was one of the world's worst cyclone till date. Yes. It killed over three to five million people. And the response of, uh, you know, was like what Mary Antoinette said, if they can't get uh, bread, let them eat cake. And that's what they treated the Bengalis. Beng uh, East Bengal was an actually some one, was something that contributed more than 50 percent of their, uh, you know, uh, of their uh, GDP, their exports, and they barely got something like 30 percent back in terms. And that's, that's, one of that's correct. That so East, so East, uh, yeah. East Bengal, uh, East Pakistan, then was treated as a colony by the West. And uh, you know, I always wonder, in, in one of those alt history moments, that if the Pakistani military had allowed Sheikh Mujibur Rahman to become the Prime Minister of uh, uh, Undivided Pakistan. Uh, would history have been any different? I'm sure it would have been, but they were thinking of the uh, uh, very short term, uh, they had a very short term horizon and uh, they did what they did in that short term and that's cost them half their country. Absolutely. That the attempts by Tikka Khan and others to really try to, uh, uh, you know, uh, like they wanted to teach them Arabic and they wanted them to they banned radio, uh, the Bangla music, which is very dear to them. And that brings me to the role of music. You mentioned that in one of your chapters about how Ravi Shankar and his disciples, Ringo Starr and uh, you know all this, they organized the Bangladesh concert on 1st of August 1971. Yes. And music did play a great role in tuning on to Radio Bangla and All India Radio. And so, so that'll be, could you tell us something more on that? Uh, absolutely, I mean, and thank you for bringing this up. I, I think music played a very, very important role um, this was the soft power approach uh, that was worked out in the 1st of August 1971. Uh, Pandit Ravi Shankar, whose, uh, uh, whose parents hailed from um, uh, East Bengal, came up with this idea to highlight the plight of his uh, uh, Bengali uh, brethren. And uh, this was the first rock concert of its kind. And this is before the live aids and you know all, all the concert for Africa's that we have now, which is very well established now. This was the first of its kind and you had, uh, you know, uh, musicians of the caliber of George Harrison, you know, and, and the whole, uh, uh, literally every, the who's who of the music world, of the Western music world were playing in this concert for Bangladesh. And I, I still remember um, naval veterans of that time, uh, war veterans then saying that that was the first time they, they'd heard of a nation called Bangladesh. And that kind of, uh, you know, imprinted itself in the, in popular imagination across the world. It was a it was a soft power coup of a kind that uh, you know we take for granted today with social media and Twitter and Facebook and what have you. But at that point to carry something out like this, a concert that told the world about the suffering of a uh, people of a, 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 a nation called Bangladesh that was yet to be born, that was a remarkable uh, you know a, a, a remarkable um, uh, a, a concert and uh, that it kind of preceded many other concerts and that was where kind of music made its impact uh, in the 71 war and of course later on a few months later uh, uh, yeah, that's correct <laughs> just a few days later in fact just a fortnight after that you have this uh, very massive commando <coughs> attack that's carried out by these young boys of uh, naval commando operations X Simultaneous attacks on four major ports of East Pakistan, uh, Chittagong, uh, Kulna Mongla, Chanpur, Narayan Ganj and Chittagong. Um, they hit 20 to 25 merchant ships literally at the same time simultaneously and they were using coded radio signals, uh, music that was played out on All India Radio 
um, uh, and and the, these two songs, these two Bangla songs that were played out to them, were the coded signals for them that this is the uh, that they had to all move and strike their targets. You were 24 hours away from your targets, and you were 12 hours away from your targets, and they all knew what they had to do the minute they played those songs. So. Yeah, coming back to your point, music did play a very, very important role in the 1971 war in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine today. No, no, that's a, that's a very interesting anecdote. In fact, the fact that you brought out it preceded even that live aid and everything. And uh, I think I must also bring out the fact that UNICEF was headed by um, yeah, the Aga Khan, uh, the President Aga Khan's father. And he was very pro-Pakistan. In fact, he taxed them. It was supposed to be, till today, UNICEF holds the uh, rights to that concert. And at that time, they didn't, the Americans put a lot of pressure on them not to allow them to receive that money. And if, in fact, even John uh, F. Kennedy's younger brother had made a trip there and a lot of money. And Indians were really very badly off at that time. We were, very, we were a poor country. And the sudden, you know, they outnumbered the population of the states that they went in and they were given refugees. So. India has a very good track record in uh, those terms. But coming to the fact that on the, 40, the 15th of uh, uh, August attack that uh, disrupted this, uh, I must get the relevance of the waterways there for these people who are listening. Because Bangladesh is a riverine territory. And while the culverts and everything, uh, there was nothing that has grown there, every ammunition or uh, food, uh, this uh, additional divisions that were moved in to suppress the Bengali uprising needed food and supplies, all of it which came by, you know, through the ports and that's the reason why this naval operation of sinking that like actually was a, you know, like crippling blow to them, which uh, the significance uh, was even felt by Eastern Command where, you know, they, they looked at those guys, I, I read, reading this, I know how I would look at somebody from the Navy sitting and occupying an office space in the uh, Fort William. And I like the way you describe Fort William, the fort uh, that had never seen war, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, but it's a nice uh, anecdote. Now coming on to the <clears throat> improvisation that we Indians are so good at, the jugaad, that factor that we have. You talked about the condoms that were used to, you know, and the fused mine, which is a delay kind of a thing that he manufactured on his own, which is very interesting. And the fact that, you know, uh, much belag much attacked ordnance factories actually met the uh, requirements of manufacturing those limpet mines and uh, you know, the other. Would you like to? That's right. So uh, uh, now this, as I mentioned, is an uh, you're looking at an all of government approach and there were no excuses like uh, it can't be done or we, you know, uh, we don't have the equipment for it or we don't have the manpower. They just went with what they had and they just went on improvising. And I, I think that is the terrific spirit of the 1971 war is the fact that here you have uh, a country that's been dismissed as an economic basket case, punching way above its uh, weight in uh, international geopolitics, and that actually uh, creates another country in its neighborhood, and you know, it defeats virtually two superpowers, China and the United States, that are working in sync, and uh, Pakistan, of course, being the main theater. So literally, you're fighting three countries. You have the backing of a, a, a third superpower, the Soviet Union. And uh, this all of government approach is something that uh, that's so remarkable. And, and uh, you know, it starts at the very uh, at the topmost level where you had the government of India, which is uh, so called, which had this policy of non-alignment, which actually goes and signs a treaty of uh, peace and friendship with the Soviet Union. Uh, which is not a military alliance, but uh, it just stops short of being a military alliance. And uh, it basically tells the Indian government that they have the backing of the Soviet Union if uh, uh, things were uh, to go, as they say, southwards. And uh, this is exactly what happened. They not only improvised at the geopolitical level, but also at the tactical level, which is where my book comes in. Uh, they did not have limpet mines uh, in the numbers that they uh, wanted. And now a limpet mine is, uh, is nothing but a magnetized explosive charge, uh, which has a very powerful magnet on one side and it's got an explosive on the other. And that fits on the side of a, a ship and is designed to explode after a certain uh, period of time. And uh, uh, this, is, this is the capability that the Navy did not have at that point. But they worked on it very rapidly. The very bright uh, people in uh, naval ordnance, the uh, engineers sat and uh, improvised these limpet mines um, and they came up with this very unique uh, uh, delay mechanism, the delayed fuse mechanism that you mentioned and it was someone's bright idea at that point 
uh, to actually coat that fuse, which is it was a soluble plug, which meant that once the limpet mine was fixed on the side of a ship, the the plug would dissolve in the water, the firing circuit would be completed, and the limpet mine would explode. Somebody came up with this idea to coat that soluble plug with a condom, which would delay uh, uh, the uh, explosion by a few, uh, by at least half an hour, which would give the the swimmer, the saboteur, time to swim away. So it was actually designed keeping the safety of the Bengali uh, commandos uh, in mind. And uh, it was a brilliant plan. And it's just that little thing that, uh, you know, it was a cherry on top, if you can call it that. And uh, this again is, you know, the, the whole spirit of the uh, Indian Armed Forces, the government, and indeed the Indian Navy in 1971 was all about improvising and fighting with what you had rather than with what you wanted. Yeah, that's a lovely, uh, you know, improvisation, which is which one that actually wins was, you know, in <clears throat> firstly, finding the right youth to train them and, you know, uh, Turn them into diving is one of the toughest. Uh, like I'm a, I'm a trained commando in the sense, but we definitely know deep sea divers and the ones who can go into water are really tough. And to train them into these kind to perform these kind of precision tasks where you right. deliver, you know exactly where to put them. It's very scientific. You can't just put a limpet mine on some part of it. You need to put it at the right place. That's correct. Yeah. So that, that's why yeah. they, they look for uh, you know youth who kind of were uh, technically. Uh, trained, you know, the college students who understood all these nuances. So it, it's a very, uh, you know, a scientific task, if you can uh, call it that, to swim, uh, you know, in different medium. You have to actually cross, you have to be physically fit, you have to do cross country runs, get to the water, then swim in the water, uh, not be disoriented, you know, plant all the explosives and it sounds very simple and, you know, but but it's it's a very, very tough uh, operation and it's full marks to the, the Navy and uh, Captain Samant and all those people who made this fantastic operation come to life. His predictions also, like he had predicted about 20% casualties. I don't think it met that target also in the sense that it speaks yes. very highly about the training. Yes. And there were some defectors in the sense who didn't perform. but. Overall, they did a fantastic job. You said about 100,000 tons of... Uh, 100,000 tons of enemy shipping that they sank between August and November of 1971. Uh, uh, they paralyzed very large parts of the waterways. Like, like you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, uh, East Pakistan then uh, was a riverine country and you needed boats, steamers, ships uh, to move from one part of the country to the other. It's just like waterways, like, like you have roadways, you have waterways in uh, what is today Bangladesh. And by selecting these maritime targets, these shipping targets, what uh, the Navy did very wisely was to paralyze the Pakistan Army's uh, modes of transport and communication and, uh, you know, the ability to move soldiers and ammunition and arms from one part of the country to the other and that's where the naval commandos came in. It was a spectacular work actually because like Napoleon said the army marches on its stomach, logistics is what defines how the army marches. There, there's, a, there's a French word for this, it's called uh, uh, commerce destruction, gear de course, which uh, is not very, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not very frequently mentioned in uh, naval terminology but it actually means that the destroying the commerce, the, the maritime uh, commerce routes of the enemy to kind of deny him sustenance, um, uh, you know, is, is to attack what you mentioned, that the fact that the army ma marches on its stomach. So you had here uh, the uh, naval saboteurs attacking the uh, sea lanes of communication, merchant ships that were coming in with food and ammunition for the Pakistan army or taking out exports, uh, you know, the uh, jute and tea that was getting the uh, military dictatorship foreign exchange, for instance, what they needed most in 1971. It was denying them that. So it was a very, very well thought of strategy. And um, it tells you again, the, the fact that navies don't exist to fight uh, distant wars in oceans. They have to fight wars that influence the course of the land battle. And here you see this aspect coming out in, uh, you know, in spectacular form, where you had every naval action was something that influenced the battle on land. And every ship that was sunk, uh, meant that the Pakistani military had fewer bullets to shoot at the Indian army or the uh, Bangladeshis. Uh, you know, they had lesser food to survive and hold out uh, against the Indian armed forces. 
and uh, this this again points to what a brilliant campaign that uh, it, this was a a war of a very different dimension that they were fighting even before formal uh, declaration of hostilities had begun that's and, and you also mentioned about you know it'll be important for us to also introduce our readers and viewers about the role played by the bangladesh the skull osmani whom you talked about who came and gave a pep talk to those soldiers and can you give a mention about all the others who were part of the 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 naval component of this <clears throat> absolutely uh, and i uh, i would be remiss in mentioning the fact that uh, uh, you know but for the uh, bangladeshi people and the, the military and the civilians none of these operations could have actually happened because uh, you had the indian navy standing away from the borders of east pakistan sending in uh, the naval commandos into do all the fighting the actual fighting was let's not forget done by the naval commandos of bangladesh and they did a spectacular job they've uh, put their lives on the line uh, to do carry out these operations and they did it at no, a great personal risk not only to their lives but also to the lives of their families who were left behind in east pakistan their friends you had cases uh, you know uh, right after the attack on chitagong on the 15th of august you had an entire village that was destroyed because it had sheltered some of these uh, naval commandos i mean that is the kind of high stakes game that the uh, bangladeshi people were uh, you know up, up against because i i think they had figured that they had nothing more to lose they were anyway being wiped out brutally by the pakistani military and this is when they decided they had their backs to the wall and they decided to fight and what a spectacular campaign they fought i know that's what something that eludes the pakistani establishment you know that's where something which i feel proud about being in a country like india which doesn't believe in defeating its own people you know we'd rather see them co-opted or absorbed in our you know and that's we would spend suffer a lot of casualties on our own side rather than whereas here it was absolute revenge you know this kind of repair, the the this thing that happened on 15th on 16th of august when they discovered all those things happen and uh, it is brutal actually even actually in the final days of the war when they picked up those intelligentsias and massacred them yes. you know and the, uh, you talked about the soviet union indo soviet friendship treaty and there was the seventh fleet coming in at that moment when the treaty was signed and announced and there was a lot of jubilation in the pakistani camp at that time and and then they when they realized that the war is not going in their favor they lined up those people and they killed them it was it was quite brutal you mentioned that in your Uh, reading them is very uh, you know it's poignant and very sad to think about the number of people that have been killed now we talked about admiral nanda's uh, role and i agree with you that you know until the 71 war <clears throat> the navy was just a sister service it looked very good men dressed in white and you know they looked just a nice thing to have ships floating around and uh, you know goa they did take part in uh, in a small measure but the other wars they really didn't take part and in fact in 65 they were totally uh, admiral nanda had you mention about that in his book you know that we won't be uh, spectators or in this next coming war and he actually altered the course he changed the navy today like you already mentioned yes. that he made the navy what it is today and yeah. there are a lot of things like uh, i recall uh, reading this that Uh, there were a lot of uh, doubts why should the navy spend on the western naval command mess and he says we make it only once yes. you know we make it and i think that is something grand about him about his vision about his ability to see far beyond you know what is possible and i think much of the credit should go to him for what what has happened about absolutely i i, I think that uh, you know like we uh, discussed earlier that the 1971 war was about having the right people at the right places and uh, i can't think of a better example than admiral s m nanda who was navy chief at that time and uh, this is something that he had decided in his mind uh, early on that when he was going to be navy chief there was uh, no way that the navy was going to sit out of a war that it had like it had in 1965 where you had the absolutely humiliating prospect of a very modern indian naval frigate that's in uh, 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 anchored in gujarat and you had a uh, pakistani uh, surface action group <coughs> bombs dwarka and the indian frigate for various reasons does not join this uh, encounter that does not uh, you know fire back and and it uh, withdraws rather humiliatingly towards bombay and admiral nanda was very very uh, you know keen that this kind of an uh, uh, repeat should never happen which is why he went in fully prepared 
in the 1971, uh, uh, in all through 1971, to ensure that the Navy had all its war plans ready and uh, they had plans for the Western theatre, they had plans for the Eastern theatre, and of course the covert theatre, which is what my book discusses. And um, it's uh, it's, a, it's essentially a story of this one larger than life individual who thought big, thought out of the box, he was aggressive, he, was, uh, he never took no for an answer and a lot of what the Navy has been after 1971 was largely shaped by Admiral Landa's thinking and the kind of boldness or you know, decisive actions that they took. It kind of steered the Navy away from uh, its, uh, if I can call it that, rather conservative origins in the Royal Navy. Uh, so here you had this uh, Navy chief who kind of takes the Navy on a different course away from, uh, you know, the kind of training that they had received to be more cautious and, you know, uh, 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 defensive. Uh, uh, defensive. Uh, so you had someone who was on the offensive, like a very aggressive uh, uh, Navy chief. And this is the kind of spirit that uh, one would like to see uh, in the armed forces when, uh, when the balloon goes up. Absolutely, like uh, there was an altercation with the FOC and C Western Command also about the possibility of attacks on Karachi. His, uh, you mentioned that in your book. His, his uh, uh, CNC Admiral Kohli, who was the uh, chief in Bombay, uh, uh, actually opposed the attacks on Karachi because he felt that Karachi was too heavily defended for a naval uh, surface uh, action group to go and risk uh, an attack. He said it's, it's too risky and uh, he dissuaded Admiral Nanda from carrying it out. And uh, there was a point when uh, Admiral Nanda mentions in his memoirs that he actually considered uh, even sacking uh, Admiral Kohli, getting a you know a replacement for a CNC. So th this actually tells you how uh, conservative the Navy was in its approach. The rest of the Navy was in its approach, and here you had this larger-than-life Navy chief who was flying around the country, uh, inspecting uh, secret commando camps, going and checking out if. You know the, uh, the the men and the warships were all in f a fighting fit. Uh, a, a remarkable story of a, 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 an admiral, uh, a service chief who led from the front. Like Nelson, you know, you know the story of Nelson when he was ordered to withdraw from there. He puts it onto his uh, blind eye and, and he sees, turned a blind see. eye. Yes, that's called turning a Nelson's eye. Yes. So he was also bold and courageous. And I'm sure if he had one blind eye, he would have stuck that telescope into that and uh, you know <laughs> so he turned a was, blind eye too. Yeah. Adversity. Yeah, that's that's. I think that's the key of a great commander. And I think, you know, truly any power, aspiring power or any true power has to have a strong navy. Yes. And history has been altered by those who held the greatest navies, whether it's Portugal by its, you know, uh, by the manner in which they completely subjugated the Asian world. It was all because of the navy. And the navy plays a great role today. America can like influence any part of the globe by the presence of the fleets all around. So Navy is an important uh, component. Absolutely. And in, in 1971, which is incidentally the only war that the Indian Navy has fought, um, is the war that elevated the Indian Armed Forces pri precisely for the reason that you mentioned, the fact that once the Navy enters a theatre of conflict, and it's very rare uh, since the Second World War, you haven't had those many engagements where navies have taken part and here you have uh, a small navy, uh, a very modestly equipped navy, uh, which had just got submarines for instance, uh, uh, doing the kind of things that you hadn't seen since the Second World War and that kind of elevated the overall profile of the Indian Armed Forces because you know, air forces and armies fight across the world but when the navy enters a, a, a theater of conflict then uh, you've elevated your skill sets and your capabilities and you start getting noticed by the big boys. Yeah, and today Indian Navy is a much sought after Navy in many ways in our, you know, in the... the Precisely, and, and the foundations for that uh, were set in uh, 1971. So, I want to come to that international coverage that you've actually covered. You talked about Mascarena stories that was carried yes. and uh, that one-liner genocide, knowing that it won't be carried. He He's a go and settle in Pakistan. I That's wonder right. how he was a Christian, probably. How yes. would he choose to go to. Anthony Mascarenhas was possibly one of the bravest journalists in the world in 1971 uh, because he had seen this genocide uh, playing out in East Pakistan. Uh, he'd seen it with his own eyes and he was taken in as an embedded journalist by the Pakistani military and they showed him, look, this is the great stuff that we are doing. We are going to uh, solve the problem so completely that there is never going to be a need for us to come back again. And that's correct. And that is the kind of 
frightening detail that he was uh, shown this plan. And Mascarenhas had made up his mind what he was going to do. There was no way that a Pakistani newspaper would carry that story. So he went back home to Karachi, uh, to the newspaper that he worked in. He quietly packed his family off to London. And then he flew out uh, via Afghanistan and he went to the Sunday Times um, where he met uh, the editor of the Sunday Times, another very brave editor, uh, Evans. Harold Evans, who uh, published his story. And that was the story that kind of uh, uh, shook, the shook the conscience of the world. And in fact, uh, Mrs. Gandhi had mentioned this to Harold Evans many years later uh, when she met him that, you know, that was that one story that made up my mind about what to do in East Pakistan. It was your story. And that was that story by my, uh, Anthony Mascarenhas, Genocide that actually told you what the Pakistan army was doing in East Pakistan. That converted the whole uh, country into a death camp. And they were systematically eliminating uh, people that they saw as uh, being opposed to uh, them. Exactly what the Jews had done, uh, what, what the Nazis had done to the Jews in uh, occupied Europe and in Germany and what uh, Pol Pot had done uh, in Cambodia. And this is something that the Pakistan army was doing in 1971. You know, I, I, when you look at what's happened in Afghanistan 20 years later, the Americans go and hand over power to Taliban. The manner in which we've handled that issue in Bangladesh, like you mentioned that in your book, which was, a, you know, they thought that Pakistanis scoffed at them, that even if you get independent, you're going to be, you know, uh, today the roles are completely reversed in the sense, today Bangladesh is an economy which is far, probably exceeds the Pakistani economy in sh in very soon. Absolutely. In and fact, uh, the Bangladesh economy is firing on all cylinders. It's growing at nearly 8%. The Pakistan economy is doing just about a 1.5%, but the Bangladesh economy is just literally growing faster than India's economy, in fact. Uh, the per capita income of Bangladesh is nearly double that of Pakistan. And this is a country that was, uh, you know, uh, called an economic basket case that uh, West Pakistan looked down upon. But, you know, making the right choices, making the right decisions in the last 20 years or so, they have completely moved away from the, the uh, you know, the, the basket case that Pakistan has now become today because of all the, uh, the, the funding of terrorism and allowing uh, non-state actors to run riot within the country and uh, uh, this, uh, you know, you know, this uh, obsessive desire to control your neighbors through terrorists, whether in Afghanistan or uh, uh, India and, and that blowback has completely devastated Pakistan today, which is something that the military, uh, the Pakistan military that rules the, that country uh, fails to understand. And the choice is very clear. There are two ways. They, they, they had two uh, uh, paths before them. You had the path that Bangladesh is on today and you have the path that Pakistan, Pakistan is on today. Yeah, that's it's a well-known fact that every other country has an army. Here, the army has a country. So that's And they've seen how it happens when and we have to be really grateful to our country for the democratic uh, credential that we have had. We've lived, we've walked our talk in many ways and we've seen that in Bangladesh. We've handed over, had we handed over those 93,000 prisoners to the Mukti Bahini, there would have been bloodbath, you know, there would have been an absolute... So, uh, the Indian military performed two rescue operations in 1971. They rescued the people of uh, Bangladesh from the Pakistan army and once the Pakistan army had surrendered, they rescued the Pakistan army from the uh, Bengali people, which is what they did. This is remarkable. I don't think there's any military in the 20th century that's done two rescue operations in a matter of days. Absolutely. That's something on such a scale. Yeah, on such a scale. And, you know, like comparing, I just talked about Afghanistan, the way the Americans have left them in that manner and the way we left, we've uh, handheld them through their, you know, some... Commodore uh, uh, went in as the naval advisor there to the thing. And That's right. He, he was the, uh, uh, so Captain Samant was the first uh, acting chief of the Bangladesh Navy and he helped uh, set up the Navy. Of course, it wasn't as, uh, there wasn't uh, much to, be, much to yeah. actually, the they didn't have any, they just had personnel, they just had the human resources and they had some uh, uh, ships that were loaned uh, to them by the Indian Navy. So he helped set up the very nascent Bangladesh Navy, which he had supervised when he was the uh, G1 of uh, the uh, NCOX operation from uh, 1971 on. So we, we really have, India did really do a great job in trying to, you know, push there. Now, and make what Bangladesh is today, you know, we have. 
And now that brings me to the current scenario. Like, you know, of late we've been hearing about events that have happened. You just made a trip to Bangladesh recently. I would like to hear from you all, like, what, what is, what, are we on the right track with Bangladesh, given the history of what we've done for them? And uh, the fact is, we acknowledge the fact that the Bangladeshis themselves helped themselves in the sense we were just yes. a push factor. Yeah. But the fact is, what do you see about India-Bangladesh relations and how do you feel the people-to-people -people contacts are? I, I see a very bright future for uh, India and Bangladesh, uh, you know, and especially after what I saw very recently, uh, the, the uh, trip that I had made for the uh, Bangla edition of the book. Uh, that was released there uh, and uh, I see a country on the move I, I, like I told you I mean, Bangladesh is the economy is doing exceedingly well uh, they've overcome a lot of their uh, you know human development indices uh, uh, human development index um, uh, yeah. challenges and uh, you know uh, they're doing well on several counts and they're like a model economy of model nation state uh, uh, they, they haven't descended uh, into the kind of anarchy that we've seen other countries, uh, you know, uh, 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 of, 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 of who've had a similar uh, legacy of colonialism and they were colonized twice, I mean, first by the British and then by the Pakistanis, but they're doing exceedingly well. And I, I see a, uh, you know, a, a very uh, a common uh, spirit of, uh, uh, of friendship and, you know, something that really comes from the heart. Uh, on both sides, when you're looking at the government of Bangladesh and the government of India, there's, uh, you know, there is this uh, mutual love and affection, if you can call it that. And the fact that, you know, they've, uh, we are in it together and uh, it, hopefully this is the way things are going to be for the next many, many decades. I know. I, I, I forgot to mention at the beginning, I, I like the way you start your book. With the history about all that, what happened to the Battle of Plassey, and then the Curzonian yes. partition that actually led this to creation of East Pakistan. Right. So, no, no history of uh, uh, Bengal or Bangladesh is complete without recounting the fact that you know the the, the very truism is that uh, whoever controls the uh, lower Gangetic uh, plains uh, the, uh, controls India because it's such a fertile region. It's been the you know it, it's been the seat of culture and civilization and uh, there have been empires that have been built literally on uh, controlling Bengal. First, it was the Mughal Empire first and then it was the, the British Empire and in, indeed Calcutta was the center of the East India Company and the British Empire before they moved to Delhi. So uh, uh, um, the initial part of the book was to understand why Bengal was so important and why the partition of Bengal uh, uh, was, uh, you know, created so much of chaos and, you know, dividing it into two countries. Bengal uh, was one of the two growth engines of India. You had, uh, you know, the ag agrarian uh, growth engines, if you can call it that, Punjab on one side and uh, you had uh, Bengal on the other. And what happened in 1947, very unfortunate, was the you actually bisected both these uh, growth engines. You divided them into half. Yeah, that's a uh, Bengal. Uh, in your book, you mentioned that a merchant of Bengal could buy out London in 1757. Yes. You know, that's an interesting thing. In fact, the ransom that Siraj Udala paid for uh, to Robert Clive and, I, and all the thing that went around for Robert Clive, he says that I was amazed at my own moderation. You yes. know? The so the, the, the East India Company built its uh, fortunes yeah, in uh, Bengal by the conquest of Bengal and they used the conquest of Bengal to fund their uh, military the campaigns and they altered the course of uh, history. history. Absolutely. World, yeah. and, uh, and this is the second time that Bengal has played a key yeah. turning uh, role in uh, altering the geography of the subcontinent. Yeah, it's, uh... So now Sandeep, I really amazed at the way you write. Firstly, you know, as a military man, you got so much of details here, which you know it imprints. You. you read it once. I wish all we have. We we need to face a examination called as military history in our and it's one of the most boring subjects. But if someone wrote like you, it was so easy to remember because I read through it. It was very firstly unputdownable, and I read through it in one shot, and and I feel like reading it again and again. I feel proud about what we've done, and I've read your previous book also on the twenty six eleven, which was again a wonderful book. So what's the next book around the corner? Well, I haven't uh, thought of anything. There are a couple of ideas and, uh, you know, writers have, I, you know, you have like a dozen ideas bouncing around in your head all at the same time. But my focus right now is to bring out the second edition of uh, Operation X. And uh, there are a lot of details that I couldn't uh, get for the first edition. There were a few personalities that I couldn't interview or would decline to int be interviewed. Uh, 
who've now agreed to uh, uh, tell me their stories, uh, not very significant parts of the book, but uh, I mean, these are details because at the end of the day, this book is all about details and it's uh, a lot of it is anecdotal because, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, written, uh, not many written records have survived uh, uh, 1971, especially this operation. So it's, uh, and are we going to see this in in television, on, on Netflix or some of the OTT platforms? Well, I hope somebody looks at it uh, from that. Because it, it, it's actually a thriller in the way everything goes around. Even the last uh, the two chapters on the Palash and Padma's bombing, it's, uh, you know, it's an unfortunate incident. It, it, it's all true. It's entirely true. And this was all thanks to, uh, you know, the vivid recollections by the military veterans that I interviewed. Uh, the Palash and Padma, for instance, was, uh, you know, literally brought to life by Lieutenant Suvesh Mitar, who was uh, the commanding officer of one of the boats. And he recounted in very great detail. In fact, the second half of the book is all, a lot of it is, uh, in, in uh, uh, thanks to Lieutenant Mithers, you know, very, very vivid recollections of what actually went on. And of course, I uh, corroborated it with other uh, veterans who had taken part. But uh, the, his story is fascinating. You had Commander Vijay Kapil, uh, another military veteran who was part of the book. Uh, there's uh, Petty Officer Chiman Singh, uh, Mahavir Chakra Award, he, uh, wounded in action. Uh, remarkable story, the first naval commando, first Indian commando, a naval commando to operate behind enemy lines. So you have, uh, the, the book is actually, it's a sum of so many remarkable stories of, you know, courage and fortitude and uh, I'm, I'm so happy that you enjoyed reading it. Enjoyed it and I'm really, in the sense, it makes you feel proud. You know, one of the things that, there's something that very unique about our subcontinent, that's particularly the Indian subcontinent, is our soldiers are amazingly brave and tales of valor and courage. There are, every era produces its own era, uh, heroes and you, you've got this chronicle for us another list of great heroes to look up to. You know, I wish more people read about these books and get inspired. What is possible? From nothing, they created a complete commando force which probably executed one of the largest uh, sabotage operations post-World War II. Yes. You know, and something that is, and it would have been unknown had it, hadn't it been for your you know, chance meeting with uh, uh, Captain Sawant and, and of course uh, your, and your, of course you mentioned it was your childhood dream to write about it. To, so you did mention in this. So, and I, I recall watching you very closely on that uh, dying days of LTT. You know, you had a very nice coverage. Do you have any story on that coming up? On the LTT? Well, uh, it was uh, very good coverage you had given. In fact, you're the only yes. one who probably covered the entire den, the tiger's lair. You went and visited that place and... That, well, it's that's another uh, story that, uh, you know, uh, we've not literally we've not seen the last uh, we've not read the last book or the last story on what actually happened in Sri Lanka because uh, this is again a story that's very similar to uh, what we saw in Bangladesh except that it's you know played out over uh, an extended period of time several decades and uh, you know there have been books that have been written there have been you know, movie shows and OTT uh, you know series that have been based on it but I feel there's plenty of scope to actually tell the story of what uh, went on in uh, Sri Lanka, particularly from the point of view of the IPKF, there's not been enough documenting of that, uh, the uh, op, op Pavan as we call it, Operation Pavan, where you had the Indian peacekeeping force going That's in there. Really That's again a very story. remarkable story. Uh, that was uh, exactly the opposite of what we'd done in 1971. I, I don't think anyone knew what was going on in 1987 when uh, the Indian Armed Forces were sent into Sri Lanka. So yeah, that is, that's possibly a story that I could look at uh, some point in the future. Uh, there's lots of stories waiting to be told and that's you know, certainly going to be one of them. Yeah, 16 years later, 87 was a disaster because it was not a whole of government. We, yes. The army we went in with tourist maps and others. Yes. Yeah. So I agree. I did watch your report with great interest and you know, you. So I wish you all the best, Sandeep, for your next endeavor and thank you for spending time with us and telling us what made you and bringing to life these words. Thank you. Our, thank you, Colonel Pillay. And I, I'd like to thank the organizers of the Pondicherry Lit Fest. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.